much did you hear what I said? Anyway, let's start. <laughs> it's about machine learning, you might guess. <laughs> so we talk about old stuff. We try to pretend this is new. No. I'm going to try to show you some simple ideas and show you how they still matter, how they um, somewhat connect machine learning not uh, uh, just to itself, but to a lot of other stuff, how ideas that we use now were not born after 2012, but they actually go back maybe 50, 70 years. Okay? The emphasis is more on algorithmic aspects rather than statistical or probabilistic aspects. So I'm very happy to discuss this offline. I'm going to be around for three days. But the emphasis here is not on statistical bounds. They just they don't even appear. Okay? They just You see at some point why they would appear. But then the emphasis is on principle to be learning algorithm. We start from the most classical one, which is empirical risk minimization. We get around it a few times to understand what people mean by things like regularization and stability and how they connect with classical notion of stability. And then in the next few days, two days, we're going to discuss a couple more uh, advanced kind of uh, perspective on uh, Brinley learning algorithms. Uh, tomorrow is going to be about the idea that when you optimize, you are already enforcing some kind of stability without knowing it. Okay, an idea that is fashionable today and is called uh, implicit regularization sometimes, but an idea that you can trace back at least to 1950s in solving integral equations. On Wednesday, we're going to connect uh, um, to, um, again, uh, one of the classical ideas, principal component analysis, the singular value decomposition, to introduce much modern, more modern stuff like sketching and random projection, which are the tools we have today to scale algorithm um, when data sets don't fit memory. Okay. So um, today is a bit, m the classes are not that dense. Today is uh, slightly more dense. Uh, so um, as we were discussing with Antonio, I, I, I know he told me, he confirmed that your background is quite diverse. Uh, hopefully the, the mathematical level you, you should be comfortable for everybody, but the conceptual level might not be. So stop me anytime. There is more material than, you know, than what I have necessarily to present. We can skip here and there. So if you try to make this a bit more interactive, you can survive your week a bit better. All right, so uh, the, the usual just motto is uh, uh, what's machine learning? Machine learning is about taking a system and rather than providing rules, provide data to solve a task together with some uh, uh, principles, okay? And what we, there are many, many perspectives on this, okay? You can take a more uh, probabilistic, you can put probability at the center of the story and take a more Bayesian point of view. You can ignore probability at once and just become, uh, uh, you know, view things as uh, purely programming and scaling things and look at computational tricks. You can look at dynamical system. There are many, many point of views. We take the point of view that in the last, I would say, 20, 25 years emerges one of the main framework to understand the properties of a learning algorithm, what is called statistical learning theory, where the emphasis is a little bit more on frequentist perspectives, okay? And I like this framework because, again, I feel it connects to many, many other uh, realm of uh, applied math and uh, uh, applied sciences in general. So that's what we're going to discuss a little bit. We're going to spend a few slides just setting it up. And you'll see that I'm going to simplify it a bit, and it's basically one slide. It's a dense slide conceptually, but it's still just one slide. Before doing that, uh, I'm going to mostly restrict myself to the realm of supervised learning, mostly because we don't really know whatever we're doing when we're not doing supervised learning. Supervised learning, where we have algorithm and theory, everything else is where we have solutions of problem that we cannot really define. Okay, so they're extremely useful in practice, and you have to learn how to use them to solve practical problems. But if you have to start a lecture, it's problematic because you have to start from that thing that we don't know how to define, but then you really, you know, clustering is the fantastic example. Clustering, you know what it means, but you don't know how to define it. So, again, so here we actually try to find, to start from the one place where we have very clear ideas on what we're doing. And just to give you a couple of examples to, you know, to set your mind before I kill you with some equations, text is uh, one possible realm. You have emails. So the, we're going to look at a problem where you have an input and an output. In this case, the inputs are emails. Okay, It can be a spam or not. And the output is whether it's a spam or not. It's like a label. It's 0, 1. Okay? In this case, the idea is always that you want to try to uh, convert the inputs into vectors or something similar, something that you can manipulate. And then you want to build the function to go from the input to the output. Okay. You're provided a set of examples, and you want to try to find out a good rule. 
This is an example where you can start to turn on your brain why we call it learning. The typical, the, the pre-learning way of solving this problem was you give some rules. If there is Viagra, probably, most likely, it's, a, it's an email, okay? If there is, a, I don't know, I'm a king and I want to give you five billion euros, probably it's an email. The problem is that then these things change, things adapt. So it would be very nice to just have a way where every once in a while you click and you delete a few, they go in a folder, you keep a few randomly anonymized, blah, blah, and you put them in the right folder. And then after a while, the system overnight while you're sleeping is saying, okay, let me take a look at these two folders and I'm gonna update my, uh, my rules, okay? But they're no longer rules because now they look at the data, okay? And you, by providing the, by deleting emails essentially, you provide supervision. You're like a teacher that says, I believe this is a spam. I believe this is not a spam, okay? That's why we call it learning, because there is this feedback mechanism by somebody that provides labels to data, and then you close the loop overnight by training your machine, okay? The nice thing about this is that now you can take emails and replace them with whatever, and this still works. For example, you could say, I want to read plates of a, of a car, and I want to be able to do it automatically, okay? So I'm going to go in and I'm going to have a camera that is gonna scan one by one the letters of the, of the plate and it has to decide whether this is, uh, what is it, a zero or a Z, for example, okay? You start and you collect all the letters. In this case, you have not two possibilities, but many. But the idea is the same. What's the input? The input is an image. An image you can trivially think of a vector if you unroll the pixels. And then in this case would be, again, I make it easy, zero Z is just one of two labels, okay? So far so good? So all this problem can now be cast in a system where you have X and Y, an email and whether it's a spam or not, another email and whether it's a spam or not, okay? Or an image and whether it's a zero or a Z. My, I, I don't use vectorial notation, okay? You kind of have to figure it out, but usually Y is gonna be a number Okay, zero, one, or a real number. And X is typically a vector or some more exotic thing, but it's a complicated object, okay? And the main point is that uh, at this level of generality, this is, a, this is a problem that appears in all kind of uh, realm from, say, statistics, because machine learning in the end of the day is statistics by 50%, but it also appears in, I don't know, function approximation, which you find uh, in, in, many different, in many different fields. Perhaps a specialty, even at this stage of generality where it didn't define anything, is that typically in all this domain, X is not one or two numbers, is a lot of numbers, okay? So if you take an image, even if it's just 20 by 20, which is a ridiculously small image, it's gonna be, what is it, 400 pixels, okay? So it's gonna be 400 dimensional. 400 is a crazy number. Anything we know about building functions, understanding geometry in 400 dimensions, it was like, that's a technical term you can learn. In the case of text, life could be a bit easier because they might be a bit dense, but still it's large and it's long, okay? So everything we know about do little drawing, I don't do a lot of little drawing, okay, because we have two dimensional boards, but they're totally misleading most of the time. You have to take a peek into a high dimensional world we cannot look at and get principle to how to navigate it in a meaningful way, okay? So that's, the, that's one of the new thing. That a new thing is that we have to handle this computationally, okay? It's not just purely, I'm gonna make a model and hope for the best. No, you actually have to, and you know, I say that machine learning is statistics 50% because the other 50% is, I don't know what is this, but I just have manipulated efficiently, okay? Literally half of the people doing machine learning are just concerned with efficient computations. So, and this is partially because now computation are really an issue. If you have 20 points in one dimension, you do whatever you want. But if you have a million points in 10,000 dimension, you don't. <laughs> Okay, you have to do something efficient, you have to worry, and you might have to end up looking at the model that is not the one you want, but is the one you can solve, okay? All right, so these are just two among endless examples that you can think of to start a company and become rich. And this is just, as I said, the wrong but necessarily low dimensional picture where the emphasis is on the fact that, again, so this is X, this is Y, these are the points you have. You have both the X coordinates and the Y coordinates. That's what you have today. And the emphasis here is on the fact that that's fitting this point might be something you wanna do, but it's not the key. The key is that you're gonna be provided a new email and you have to say, is it 
a spam or not. You're going to provide a new image, and you have to say, is it a zero or a Z? Okay, so the emphasis is about, it's not that much about purely fitting or interpolating the data, but you're able to extrapolate, to do inference. So learning at heart is the problem of giving data today to make observe, you know, observation today to make statement about the future. So if you're a physicist, this might, sounds vaguely familiar, okay? The main difference here is that you give up finding very detailed description of your model, and you just say, I'm ignorant about it, but I got a lot of data, and I'm gonna just try to fit some you know, non-parametric statistical model. You, you give up uh, somewhat explanation and interpretability on one side to try to find something that can work well. With all the tricky aspects that this might uh, imply, right? Because you still have to be sure that it doesn't just work on this data, it has to really be meaningful for all the data, okay? <clears throat> and you know, th that's, that's basically the short story in a cartoonish way. Okay, you are given data, input and out, we want to find a function, and the function should be good not for the data you have before, but to future data. That's it, okay? Now, this level of precision is not, you know, is not enough to distinguish learning from a bunch of other, other things you find in the literature, for example, What's the nature of this data? How can I even hope to be able to do this, okay? The data must be related somehow. The data that I see already must be related somehow, okay? If you take the page of a, uh, of a book and the first letter in the book as your uh, input-output, good luck with that, right? And the data that arrives later must be related to the one you see today, okay? Because otherwise, the hope that you can, you know, you can make a prediction about the future is completely meaningless. So this makes sense, but not really. Okay? You cannot hope to actually do anything at this if you don't make some assumption on the process that underlying uh, your data um, collection mechanism. Okay? So what you need to do is to say, okay, my input and output are related somehow. And I have a notion of observation I see today, observation I see tomorrow, and then I can make some uh, uh, reasoning about how to do this, okay? Of course, you can also just start and say, oh, let me hack this around, but that's not what we want to do. So what we do is that we consider the most basic statistical learning setting. And the most basic statistical learning setting basically is the def completely defined by one ingredient, which is exactly the one relationship between input and output, okay? Which we assume to be a probability distribution. We assume that x and y are two random variables and there is a joint probability distribution on x and y, okay? This reflects our uncertainty about a bunch of things. When we pick the axes, we don't really know exactly which one we're picking, okay? If we take a picture of a camp of, uh, say, of a letter of the plate, there can be noise, okay? There can be perspective. Uh, that can be that you know, there is a bias towards certain letters than certain others. There is all kinds of uncertainty in the way you collect the data. And similarly, the moment you put labels, okay, there might be mistakes. Okay? There are mistakes because it's problematic, because I'm lazy, because I'm sleepy, because really there is the Z and the two look similar, and if there is enough noise, you won't be able to describe it. So it's probability you dump it all in. And notice that there is everything. Okay? There might be that you compress the image to a low resolution so they suck and you cannot read them anymore. So there is not an attempt to try to model every aspect, which could be interesting. It's more an attempt to dump everything into something that somewhat reflects our ignorance, and we like to call it uncertainty or whatever you want, okay? That's the first and only, <laughs> if you want, tool of the game. This is really the only ingredient, okay? That, that's the basic axiom uh, that we put. There is a probability distribution that generate, uh, is gonna be behind our data generation. Then there are a couple of twists, which are what the statistical learning theory setting prescribe. The one is you're not gonna be interested to find the probability distribution itself. You could, it's a legitimate question, but that's not what you wanna do. What you wanna do is that you wanna be able to make prediction. That's what we said here, okay? We said, given an image, we wanna say what's next. And to do that, you might not need to actually find the whole probability distribution. You just have to be able to find a good function, okay? So you have to define what is a good function. What is a good function? A good function is something that allows me to predict well, given x, y, okay? So it's something for which the error I make is small. So you introduce a notion of error, 
After all, you're looking in, to make a deterministic prediction within a probabilistic environment, so you're going to make mistakes. So you introduce a measure of error, and then you say that what you really like to make small is the average error over the entire distribution. So this is deep, okay? Because first of all, this is an insane request because you don't have access to this, so it's, only, it's purely theoretical, okay? Ideally, I would like to do this because this means that I would make the error on past and future data small. So at this level of generality, we can only agree that this is a pretty reasonable goal. If I could look at the future, I would like to make my prediction good for everything, okay? And then at this point, you can define in two lines the, the problem. The problem, the mathematical problem is to solve the minimization of this error, which is just a minimization problem. It's a variational problem. But the twist is that you don't have access to this P. All you have access is a bunch of observation from this P. OK? So you define a problem, which is what you would like to do, and then you almost immediately have to give up the fact that you cannot solve it exactly, but you have to leave you an approximate solution because you don't have access to this. So why is the expectation of taking the respect to the joint distribution rather than the conditional distribution applied to the matrix? So the question is why here the, the, uh, the expectation of over both x and y rather than fixing an x and taking a y? Well, you want to, if you pick just an x, you just know what you're going to do on the specific x, OK? And so it's a local measure of error. Assume, for example, that you have a distribution where you have te it's, finite, it's finite. You have 10 x's, OK? Five of them have probability, uh, which is 80% of the rest, OK? So well, you, you just have two x, OK? And one of them happens nine times out of 10, and the other happens one times out of 10. Where do you want to make errors? What I'm trying to say is some images, say some text, might more, be more likely than some others. And you want to pay more for those, OK? If, uh, you know, if you want to pay a face recognition of, uh, uh, that to put on uh, that door, and uh, it, you know, there is me, Antonio, and Chris, you can ignore me well, and you're not going to pay much, right? So, because there are going to be a ton of weights on images of Antonio. On, you know, mates, I, I don't show up. So from a statistical point of view, you don't want to put a lot of weights on my face. So this is like how many times you see a certain x. And this is saying, if you see it a lot of time, you should pay more. If you don't see it many times, you should pay less. That make sense? If you fix just one x, you just don't know how many times it happens. You might decide that you want to pay as much for me, for him, which you might want to do, but you have to be aware of it. OK? All right, that's it. That, that's the problem, OK? <clears throat> In the problem right here, we're actually making a pretty strong assumption, which uh, uh, imagine during the week you might talk about things like dynamical system or reinforcement learning. This is where we stand a step away from that, because we're making the assumption that A, the data always come from the same mechanism that doesn't change over time. OK? So that's the first big assumption we make, which Say, if you put, again, the camera on top of the door, might not be such an insane assumption, OK? If you want to try to predict whether it's going to be raining or not tomorrow, it's a totally insane assumption. So as soon as your data really have a somewhat a dynamical structure, you do this, it's insane. But there are a lot of cases where even when it's insane, it's good enough to be able to make some kind of qualitative statement. And a lot of other cases where it's worked just fine. And the other assumption we make hidden here is that the process of making prediction will not influence the problem of data collection, OK? So not only the data don't change over time, but whatever I'm doing is gonna, not going to influence what I see next. So this is somewhat uh, the big step away from saying reinforcement learning, where you have co constant interaction between the data um, generating process and the learner, OK, which constantly affect each other. But it also goes away for things like active learning, where you're uh, given the right to actually ask specific point, say, oh, I saw this, I make these mistakes, give me that point, OK? If you want to learn, say, a step function, after a while you understand there is a step, and you say, give me points there, don't give me points far away, because that's the only place where something happens, OK? The reason why we do this is mostly for the sake of simplicity, and it's mostly because that's the one place in machine learning where we do have a very clear idea of uh, a lot of things, OK? Uh, and most of the rest is uh, uh, as a more of an uh, infancy stage. 
All right, so that's, that's so far just defining the problem. Okay, now we want to build, uh, wanna build uh, something inside this framework. Any questions about this? How many of you are familiar with the statistical learning setting? All right. So for the familiar, you see I'm also making a few simplifications along the way. For example, I stick to the square loss. You can actually consider other loss function. You can consider, say, a logistic loss function, an absolute value. I don't care. What I talk about won't be really uh, addressing the problem of choosing a loss function, which is a long story short. It's probably independent. Okay? So uh, for me, I'm just going to stick to that because that's not what the meat of my discussion is going to be. Yes. In a minute, yeah. So the other point that Antonio is raising is here. So this problem is completely unapproachable for two reasons. Okay. Reason one, you don't know the expectation. So if you just try to do the derivative and set it equal to zero, it's going to be theory, but not practice. Question two, even if you could do that, here I'm actually defining overall possible functions. Okay, which is something that, again, you cannot manage. It. It's kind of annoying to write in the computer any possible function. Okay. Let me also say, because something that I learned recently uh, and I didn't realize, that this may also model situation. Not, so in the classical machine learning setting, you assume that this you don't know, okay? and then you have to approximate because all you have is data. But at least, in, in, especially in physics, and more generally whenever you do simulations, you might actually have the case where you know this. Okay, you can generate the data according to some standard model that you like and you believe is correct. You just don't want to do that. You want to do something faster that every time you make a prediction, generate a gazillion points. So you first try to learn, uh, generate a bunch of data, and then you find some reasonable function once and for all just to make it quick. Okay, the problem is not that much that you lack data. You're actually dying, start, you know, you're completely flooded with data, but you want to be able to make prediction in a reasonable way. So in high energy physics, they can just generate uh, enormous amount of data, and the problem is mostly to be able to process them and try to make prediction fast, okay? Either way, one way or another, of course this changes the game a little bit, but, uh, but not that much, because in the end of the day, uh, it's just a matter of how many points you're going to have, but you still have the problem to try to get from finite data a good approximation to the original problem. Okay? Now, before we get to try to make algorithm, I'm just going to make a couple of remarks about how, what is an algorithm and how you measure its quality. It's going to be the obvious way. An algorithm is a map that, given the data, returns a function, which is an approximate solution of this. Okay? This is very vague in general. Anything is like this. You can have... You, you, I'm going to typically denote with the hat the quantity that depends on the data. I'm not going to put the depends on the full data sets, not even on the number of points, but use a hat of a reminder to be careful because things do depend on the data. And then, you know, the, how do you measure the quality of an F? Typically in mathematics, what you do is that you try to find functions that are close to function. You typically don't look at, you look at minimizers. Okay? But in machine learning, the thing that is meaningful is the error itself, is the objective function. Okay? Because this is interpreted as the number of errors you make into the future. You don't care about two functions being the same if they, or different. If they, all you care about is that they have the same prediction performance in the future. And this is what this means. This is the prediction performance in the future. So you want to find the function today, based on the data you have, that ideally should have an error close to the best possible error. Can you compute this quantity? Just a sanity check if I've been talking to nobody for. No, because the only one object we introduced this L is the expectation over everything, and you cannot have access to this. Still, you can do theory of this. This is what you want to do. Well, after all, I define the problem by solving this, and I want to know if I solved it or not. Okay? So I want to know if the, what I found is a good solution of this problem or not. This is the obvious way. Okay? I have an approximate minimizer. I check how far it is from the true. Minimum. In practice, if you want to try to quantify this, you have to notice that this is actually a random quantity because it depends on the data, and the data are not fixed. And so you have a couple of different ways of doing this. You can either show that as the number goes to infinity, you get the right solution, or even better, be able to say how fast it's going to happen. Okay? So the whole is called statistical learning theory because you actually attach this kind of uh, 
certificate that have a statistical nature, they have a probabilistic nature, okay? This is what is typically, convergence is typically called consistency, and this is one of the many forms of a bound where you look at the probability going to zero, okay? You can rewrite this in 15 different ways, talk about sample complexity, learning errors, and so on and so forth. We're actually gonna, not gonna talk about these too much, okay? But this is what we wanna talk about. How the hell you build the learning algorithm, okay? And basically, we're gonna, what we're going to discuss today is somewhat the natural, one natural way of doing this, based on so-called empirical risk minimization, which is kind of doing the, the obvious thing, which is, okay, what, I, what is that I don't like in this? That I don't know the expectation, and I cannot work with the space of all possible functions. So in most we're going to discuss today, what we do is that we replace the expectation with what we can compute, the empirical average, and replace the space of possible function. In my case, I'm going to replace this with linear functions. Okay? That's it. I go from not accessible to high school, which is refreshing. Now, you can complain right away that this is too simple, okay? that linear functions are too simple. But before you complain, there are at least a couple of reasons why you don't want to complain too much. The first one is that if the intuition that functions that are linear is too simple, are too simple comes from this plot. If I give you five points, okay, in generic position, when it's so generic, it's quite unlikely that you can fit them with a the line. Okay? That's one intuition you can have from drawing things in one dimension. But you can also imagine that you write down this other. this other set of relationship. <coughs> if you try to fit the data with a line, okay, you find the line that should fit the first couple, the second couple, the third couple, and so on, you can collectively write this down as a linear system, okay, in an equation and the unknowns. And then it's easy to convince yourself that as soon as D is much bigger than N, or it's not a bunch bigger, is bigger than N, then you can fit them perfectly. Okay, so a line is poor, but in high dimension you can still fit perfectly. Okay, so if you over parameterize, if you have a lot of parameters, if you have a lot of variables, you have to be already careful that the linear model is not overshooting. Okay, I'm not saying anything smart here. Okay, I'm just saying something stupid that you should this, that you also should pair with something else, which is basic, which is this. So be careful because one reason why lines are not so stupid is because when you're in high dimension, they can actually fit anything you want, okay? And we see it, we're gonna, be, we're gonna have a certain freedom what we mean by X. You can actually build features, you can build dimensions somehow, so you can increase the dimension of what you do. That's reason one, okay? Still, I'm not trying to say in any way the linear function is all you need. In fact, in a lot of problems, you need much more. You need no linear functions. But it turns out that most no linear functions we know are built on the basis of this. Okay? We're typically going to put some no linearity before the line or inside the line, and then we're going to try to uh, see what we can do with that. Okay? So by understanding what's happening here, you can still go a long way in understanding what happens when, even when you consider more complicated functions. And in fact, for at least uh, a big chunk of them, the extension is essentially trivial, and we're going to discuss if I have time at the end of this class. Okay? So the reason for this is mostly pedagogic, and is mostly because it makes the notation much less heavy. <clears throat> so what he's saying, for now I'm just, you give me the data and I fit, okay? And I fit the data and I try to see what's going on, okay? Now, notice that on the one hand you're fitting, but again this discussion becomes interesting because I'm fitting but not on all the data, right? Okay, I'm not, sorry, on all, on all the functions. I'm not taking all possible function space. I'm taking a relatively small function space. So if it is true that when D is much bigger than N, I can do whatever I want, when D is much smaller than N, I'm back in this situation. So I'm fitting kind of because I choose this model space which is so small that I won't be able to fit that much, okay? So 
if you see this dimension as a free parameter that you can move, then you're already thinking about the situation where you can fit or not, okay? But we're gonna discuss this for an hour, so uh, you shouldn't, uh, that should not be a problem. But for now, I'm not putting constraints and I'm not thinking about doing this and that. We're gonna do that in a minute, okay? That's what we wanna do, and we wanna think about this a little bit, just warming up a bit with linear algebra, essentially, for a little bit, okay? Okay, so literally for the next 20 minutes or so, we're just gonna do a reminder of basic linear algebra, okay, that you can easily extend to much fancier functional analysis if you wish, but this is enough for us, okay? We just wanna think about the linear system and go a bit slowly over this kind of reasoning because then we want to um, pimp them up for three days. So the one observation, one, it's useful to really go to this kind of vectorial notation that I was using here. So I actually call the data matrix X hat and the output vectors y hat. So this is just the collection where in each row you have one of the inputs. So an image, another image, another image, another image. So D is the pixel, say. Let's stick to the images for the sake of simplicity. So images and pixels, okay? And Y is, is it a Z or not? Then you can... Uh, Then you can rewrite this in just matrix form like that, okay, just trivially. And this means that basically we're looking at the least square problem associated to a linear system. There is a linear system underlying everything, which is again, is gonna give us some, some mileage because now we can now ask the question about, okay, what do we know about the linear system? Hopefully all of us know a little bit. And then you can ask question of how, what do we know is now overlapping what I just introduced before, the story that the data are random and they come from a distribution and the goal is not to just solve this linear system but use this linear system to actually peek into future data, which is a new twist. That's not what you usually do. Usually you're given a linear system and you try to solve it. Here we wanna solve it for a specific reason which changes the perspective a little bit. All right, but let's do it anyway. So again, this is a bit of a, a, a refresher. Let's consider first the situation where you have more data than unknowns, okay? Then what happens is that uh, uh, you have that the output, okay, has a higher dimension than the number of uh, unknown, that this, so if D is the number of free parameters you have to fit, then the vector can be larger, generally it's gonna be longer and you cannot just explain it with the space, so all you have to do is to find the closest point here. So you find the W, then when you map here, it gets to the point closer to that. Okay, that's the geometric meaning of this norm. So you do least squares because when n bigger than d, the solution to p does not exist and you want to find the best possible projection. Okay? <clears throat> now, if you just do the derivative and set it equal to zero, you find this equation. Here there's nothing interesting going on. You literally just take the derivative of the square, you set it equal to zero, and you get the linear system, which is not surprising because you're deriving a quadratic function. So you get linear constraints when you set them equal, the derivative equal to zero. All right, fair enough. I'm assuming that everybody is okay with this kind of stuff. If you're not, stop me a bit. For now, nothing is going on. Now you can consider now the somewhat over-parametrized regime where n is, uh, is uh, much smaller or smaller than D, okay? Now you don't have the problem anymore that this guy can fall outside. Again, I'm generally assuming that the, you have to take the smallest of the rows and the columns and they're linearly independent, okay? So you can actually make life a bit more complicated when you say N is smaller than D, but even the N can be linearly uh, dependent. I'm not gonna do this just because of the sake of simplicity, but you, it's easy to see at some point where this would make a difference, okay? So keep it there for a minute and we get back to that if it's bothering you. Anyway, so in this case, if you again assume that you don't have the genericity in a, the, a low rank of your matrix, then the data is gonna fall within the set of parameters, you have more unknown. So the problem is not that you cannot explain the data, but the problem is now that you might have multiple solutions. You can clearly fit them, okay? But now the problem is that you have multiple solutions, okay? Again, this is a reminder, if X, okay, have a solution W, and now what you have is that the, uh, 
there are vectors that generate zero once you apply x, so in the null space, then of course you can now generate infinitely many solutions. You take any of these vectors, you add it with what you found, and you find another solution. Okay? So you have a problem of non-uniqueness. Now how do you solve this? Okay? How you pick one among all the possible solutions? The classical way is to say among all the possible solutions, I find one with minimal norm. Okay? Sometimes you can view this as an energy, Okay, you can just view it as a constraint. It is the classical way. And this is the 1955 kind of way. Okay, in the last 20 years, you can ask, oh, why don't I put in the norm one, norm three, norm four, norm six, entropy, this and that? Because we want to keep it easy. Okay? Because we want to do something easy, and this allows, uh, it's classical, so we know a lot of stuff. Now, if you make this choice, now you took uniqueness away. So you, so you, well, no, you put it back in, I guess. You, you put non-uniqueness away, and you get uniqueness back in. And all you can ask, you can ask now, what about the face of the solution? Okay, and you can just do a quick computation with Lagrange multipliers to show that the solution of this looks very similar to the one you had before. In some sense, you swap the order. Okay, before you had x transpose x, x transpose. So you invert the x transpose x which notice is d by d, okay? And now you, turns out that what you, the right things to do is that you have to actually uh, invert the xx transpose, which notice that makes sense, right? Because you have a rectangular matrix that is either like this or like this, and basically you're saying, depending on which one is thinner of the two, I'm gonna build the smaller square matrix I can, okay? That presumably is invertible, and then I'm gonna invert that. That's, that's kind of returning the, the, the natural thing to, to, to do, okay? So this problem now is n by n, okay? So you take the smallest between n and d, and you do. So if you have degeneracy, you will still have to take care uh, to do a little bit more, okay? So far, so good? So this is my primary linear algebra for grown-up people that don't know what you're doing this. It's going to be useful in a minute, I promise. All right. So this is the summary. The, the main character here is this pseudo inverse. OK, here the, the dagger stands not for a joint or anything. It's either one of these two matrices. OK, it's the so-called Murpen-Road pseudo inverse is uh, not quite the inverse, because this matrix is rectangular, might not be invertible, but this is a notion of inverse, which is good enough for our purposes. It's a notion of inverse in the least square sense, or in the minimum norm sense, okay? <clears throat> okay, so another, well, there is one last way to look at this, and then we're gonna ask the question whether it's a good idea or not, okay? Going back to the question of we restrict, uh, what kind of restriction we made. To do that, it's useful to consider the uh, singular value decomposition of the matrix X. Everybody knows what the singular value decomposition is? There's somebody that doesn't know it? All right, so if you don't know it, which is good because I can tell you now rather than that, uh, think of it as, you know what the eigenvalues and eigenvectors are? Okay, these are for nice matrices that are typically uh, square and the one we like are symmetric and positive definite. If you have a rectangular matrix, you have a similar decomposition, okay? So if you have a matrix A, you take vectors, and you write like this. So these are vectors, you collect, you know, these are the eigenvectors, and these are the eigenvalues, okay? So I put together all the relationships. This is one eigenvector, another one, okay? <coughs> Here the relationship is similar, but what you have is that because it's rectangular, you're going to have two sets of vectors. There, you have the singular vectors from one side and the other. Let me see which way I used. I used this. So you're going to get that you put V here, but this is N by D. So it has to spit out something of dimension N, OK? So you get an N by, uh, what did I do? R. So 
I rewrote this there, so you can stay there for a minute. So this is the classical eigen decomposition. This is the, the singular value decomposition. You put the eigen, something that looks like an eigenvector here, but you get something which is not the same eigenvector. You have to change the dimension, otherwise it doesn't make sense. And that's the other pair of singular vectors, okay? So in a singular decom value decomposition, you can think of it generalizing the eigen decomposition for a rectangular matrix, and it spits not eigenvalue and eigenvector, but eigenvalues and singular, singular values and singular vectors, which are two set of vectors. One, these usually are an eigenbasis for the space, okay? You, now you have two set of eigenbasis, one for the RD and one for RN, one for the set of rows and one for the set of columns. So that's what it is, okay? So it's a generalization of eigen decomposition, if you wish. Why this is useful? Because now you can write down the action of any matrix as essentially a multiplication by some numbers. You change basis, and a matrix just becomes multiplying something by some numbers. What? The singular vectors exactly. Particularly, if you do the application of the matrix itself, you can take a vector w, write it on the basis of the v, find the coefficients, multiply by the singular values, and then just multiply everything by the corresponding eigenvectors singular vectors of, uh, of Rn, okay? Again, if you know this, I'm using too many words, but there's nothing going on here. I'm just writing, I'm just writing the obvious way, the action of a matrix on the singular system, okay? Why do we like this? Because now we can look at an inverse with uh, clearer eyes, okay? Because the pseudo inverse, first of all, notice that here I start to put R, okay? Fixing what I've been putting under the rug up to now. What is R? Well, it's the rank of this matrix, okay? In the simplest case, this would just be the smallest between N and D. But now you can think of it also be smaller between the two, okay? It doesn't matter. This still will hold, okay? And now you can write down the, the, the matrix, the action of the inverse, just this way, okay? Is the, is the same equation as before, but you see the nice thing is that you can use what is called spectral calculus to give out an explicit expression of the matrix just in terms of an inverse of the eigenvalue. So rather than think of manipulating matrices, you can now manipulate numbers, which we know how to do a little better, okay? So this is the face of the pseudo inverse. Again, nothing going on here. I'm just going briefly over things, okay? <clears throat> so this is linear algebra. Up to now it's only linear algebra, let me summarize. So you start from the statistical learning problem, but then you boil down to least squares. Then you say, okay, but this is stuff I studied in another book. So let's open the other book. You open the other book and you say, okay, I have unknowns, equations. I can have one bigger than the other, overdetermined, underdetermined. You do a couple of derivatives. You think about it a bit. And it turns out that the central object is the pseudo inverse, okay? This thing that you can write down in two different ways. And you can think of it as the way to invert a matrix which is not invertible, okay? What do you do? Well, this is one way to think about it. You diagonalize it, and then you pick all the eigenvalues that are bigger than zero, and you invert them. The other ones you just kill, okay? Notice that here, I'm just going up to the rank, okay? Any questions about this stuff? So this is our necessarily mathematical background, because what we want to ask is, what the hell are we doing from a statistical learning point of view, okay? What did we do with respect to fitting the data, making prediction, and so on, and are we done? <clears throat> well, first of all, we can make one observation, okay? This is writing everything on a basis, but it's not just any basis. It's the basis of eigenvectors of this. Sorry, singular vectors of this. So it's a specific basis. We're not, we're throwing away some dimensions, and we're somewhat putting more weights or less weights in certain dimensions by these inverse singular vectors. And what are these eigenvectors? Well, they have a name, they, uh, they're called PCA, they're the principal component of your data, and they can be seen, now, if you know statistics, you can view them as the direction where your input data have maximum variance. But if you know math, you also know that this is, a, if you give me a set of vectors, the best way to approximate the vectors in L2 sense is to exactly take the first, whatever, eigenvectors of the matrix of, of these vectors, right? So you have a matrix, you want to find the best R or K rank approximation, and you diagonalize the matrix and you truncate. That's it. So these are the direction that retain most of the information in the input data. And in some sense, this algorithm seems to like those, okay? Those direction. It likes those direction. Completely unsupervised, if you want. They are completely direction in the inputs, okay? And this algorithm is to like those because it puts weight on those, okay? And this comes from the fact that we put here 
this two norm. Okay, if you don't put here a two norm, you put something else, you change the game. But if you put there the two norm, everything somewhat comes together in this specific way, and turns out that this particular set of vectors is meaningful for this algorithm. Okay, he likes those directions. In the space of possible solution, not all solutions are the same, not all directions are the same. The direction with big singular value can correspond to big singular values are more interesting than the other ones. Okay, that's what this is saying. So from a statistical point of view, you start to put what you might call the bias uh, in the sense uh, of implicit, no, on the inductive bias, not in the sense of getting an offset through the expectation. So you somewhat put preferred direction. You, you break the symmetry of the space, and you start to say, I like going in that direction better than going this direction. So implicitly, you're making an assumption that's a good idea. Okay? It's hidden in this algorithm. If that's a bad idea, you're already lost. If your solution was sparse on the canonical basis, good luck with that doing this, right? Because you're just going somewhere else. So this is the first place where a bunch of innocent decisions led to actually realize that we actually make fairly big assumption on the model. Not only that it's linear, but in our Mongo linear function, we like some solutions better. Okay? So that's the first realization. We are actually doing some kind of belief, uh, imposing some kind of belief, implicitly just by doing this simple math. That's the first observation one. Then you can ask yourself, is this enough or there's something that could go wrong? And again, if you think what's written in the book that you just opened, the one about linear system, typically there is a complaint at this point. What, what, what might go wrong with this one expression here? The matrix is not diagonal. So you say the matrix is not diagonal, but you can take the singular value decomposition. So that's fine. Okay. So you can do that. The eigenvalue is zero, you killed, but you're on the right track. So he's saying, well, the matrix might not be diagonalizable. No, it's fine. What is the eigenvalue are zero? They're not, because they put the rank constraint to go up to the smallest, which is not zero. But still, the problem is that it's not zero, but can be extremely small. So in that book, it's written that that's typically not a good idea. Because if this guy is very small, in a perfect world where nothing moves, there's no problem. But if you start to have anything that moves in this expression, this thing can explode and be completely different. For example, if I take here a y, and now I take another y, I can take a w, I can get a w, which is completely different. OK, that's a problem in the numerical linear algebra book. But is a problem for us? Well, let's see. I give you this set of images. You make a prediction. And then I take an image. I kick three pixels. And you say something completely different. That sounds kind of annoying, right? There is no prediction yet, but it's there. Okay. When will this happen? Well, it must be most likely where I have many of these numbers and they start to have a big sequence. Okay. But clearly, it can happen. Okay. It can happen that if these eigenvalues are small and if I make some change, then things can blow up. And notice that you know, if I change y, which is the classical thing you do in linear system, this can go wrong. But even if I change u or v. Or even S itself, this can go wrong, OK? You can have a small change, and pfft, the whole thing explodes. Absolutely, yes. When you say small, when you say small what the hell does it mean? Okay? Typically, what you do is that you take the biggest eigenvalue, the smallest eigenvalue, and you look at the ratio, because then it's a relative statement. And this ratio is called the condition number. So, if you like that term and if you know what it is, you can say, if the condition number is bad, this can be an extremely bad idea. Both because try to do it in Python or math or whatever you do, and it's going to say, go away. But also because if you change the data slightly, you're going to get a completely different solution. And that's a problem for learning, not only for stability from a numerical point of view. You know, revive itself is a statistical problem. And instability in terms of fitting the data too much and then getting poor prediction in the future. <clears throat> now, we're not going to pursue this direction, and we can stop the intuition here, but I just want to attach a couple of equations to what I just said. In practice, this is what you do. You have least squares. You set the derivative equal to 0, you get this linear system. Okay? In theory, in the moment you replace all possible functions with linear functions, you can at least do the computation with the expectation. And it's very easy, and I just give you the solution. There's nothing going on. You just take the derivative, and then what you get is that the expectation of xx transpose, and here you get the expectation of x cross y. Okay? So you, you get a, new, a linear system, 
with this quantity that you cannot solve. So in the, if you do this, you can really do a parallel, which is more a linear algebra like a parallel. In practice, you have to solve this linear system. In theory, you would like to solve this linear system. So it's literally like the case where you have a linear system where both the data term and the matrix itself are subject to perturbation, which is not the usual perturbation. It's kind of a random discretization, OK, plus noise. But at a high level, this just gives you the picture of what's going on. And this can actually be made, developed and make precise. A connection between inverse problems, linear systems, and statistical learning, which is more of a matrix flavor. Okay? Again, you solve this linear system because that's all you can do, but you would like to solve this. So you replace this vector by this, because you can compute, and you replace this matrix by this. Okay? And so the, the question we asked a second ago is not just abstract is condition number bad. No, it's bad. It can be very bad. It can be that I, you know, I'm making really an approximation. So I would really like to solve this problem, but I'm solving that. So if I have a bad condition number here, what do I do? This can really blow off everything. Okay? And of course, now, you can, if you like math, you can go on and try to quantify this. You can do random matrix theory. And that's basically what you're going to show that this is the expectation this is the expectation of this. This is the expectation of this. You do a bit of random matrix theory, try to put everything there. You can quantify everything I said and get quantitative statement rather than a qualitative, but that's not what we're going to do. What we're going to do is that you believe me that things can go really wrong, and you try to fix them, and we see the first way to fix them. I need to drink. Do you have questions? All right, so just, uh, just in terms of terminology, one of the most abused word ever is regularization because uh, uh, it's used all over the world, all over the place with different, slightly different meanings. Here I want to just clarify a couple of meanings. If you look at, for example, in the uh, literature of signal processing, okay, what we just did is already called regularization. It's called regularization because the moment in which among a set of possible solution, you go and pick the one with minimal two norm. It's like this selection principle is called regularization. Okay? If I convert to the minimal norm solution, I'm regularizing. It's fine. I mean, if you agree that that's what we're going to call regularization, it's fine. Okay? But if you look at the classical literature on regularization and inverse problems, that's not called regularization. It's called the pseudo solution. It's just an approximate solution. It's another name. Okay? But then the name regularization is reserved from something else. So typically, we don't call this regularization. Well, typically, we don't. Typically, people in inverse problem don't call this regularization. They call it a pseudo solution. Signal processing people call this a regularization. But the point is that regularization is also uh, used for something else. It's used to something that is close to this, but has a better condition number. It's more stable. It will incur less in this problem of blowing up if I move things a little bit. So in classical regularization theory, the name is attached to that notion. Okay, to the notion of something which is stable. Not that much that is unique and, uh, and exists, but it's stable in some precise sense. And what we want to see today is how to achieve that in the classical way. So how do you do it classically? Well, if you want, one way to go back to the definition of the pseudo-inverse, I showed you the definition in terms of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. There is another definition, which is basically this. Take as transpose add plus lambda and then X transpose, or do the other thing, you move the X transpose before. The pseudo inverse correspond to the case where you let lambda go to zero, okay? That's the definition of pseudo inverse. And a possible idea to fix it is to say, well, what if I don't let lambda go to zero? What if I take lambda strictly bigger than zero? If I take lambda equal to zero, I'm back to the game before. What if I take lambda strictly bigger than zero? Let's see what happens, okay? The spoiler is that the smallest eigenvalue of this, or singular value of this, is now going to be driven by lambda. And now I can control the condition number. Okay? And by controlling the condition number, I can play with the stability that was causing problems. <coughs> now, this basic idea, yes. Take care to pull down that minimum value in the beginning. 
How, how would you do that before I, I answer your question? You kill them? You could, okay. So uh, let me see what's going on afterwards. Give me one second and, I, and we, we comment on what you're saying, the next line, okay? So the question is about, this is, this is putting some kind of bias, but, and it's basically fixing the problem of small eigenvalues. Could I somehow cure the small eigenvalues some other way? The answer is yes, and the next slide is very easy to see, but you will not put the problem of introducing a bias away. You just put the bias in a different way, okay? So, okay, so anyway, so this is, this is the equation. Now, this is actually comes out uh, of different names, okay? Is uh, the classical, uh, basically is an idea that uh, seemingly appeared in the 60s, okay? Uh, people that solve linear system and integral equation called this Tikhonov regularization or Tikhonov Phillips regularization, but around the same time, it was proposed in statistics we precise these symbols and it's called ridge regression, okay? And they're roughly the same idea. They, they, that's basically the underlying intuition, okay? You can drive this from a bunch of ways. And it's not unrelated to uh, some deep uh, uh, reasoning in statistics related to what is called the Stein effect, which is basically showing that maximum likelihood might not be the best possible estimator. Okay, and uh, if you introduce a bias, you get something better. We're not going to discuss this, but these are just three, point, three pointers. You find these ideas in three relatively distant places, uh, you know, integral equation, linear system, and statistics, and the Stein effect is actually the cute things to look up if you have never done it. So we want to understand a bit better how this relates to what we said before. We can do it in two ways. One is to just do the same trick we did before. We do the singular value decomposition, and we see now what happens. Okay, and what's happening is that instead of the one over S term, now we get this. This is gonna contribute a singular value, and this is gonna contribute a square of the singular values, and then plus lambda. So this is the expression you have, okay? So you had one over S, now you have S divided S squared plus lambda. Okay? Yes? So the solution here is pi S, right? Is what? Pi S. Bias. bias, absolutely yes. So lambda here can control the bias. That thing, yeah, with that, with that, I'm doing that without saying it, I'm doing that. If you know what the bias variance trade-off is, it's a spoiler, that's what we're doing. I'm not assuming that you know, I wanna show you why you wanna do that, <laughs> okay? So one way to say, so one way to introduce this, which is not what I will talk about, is to say I introduce a bias and then I trade off with the variance, and I'm just telling you now, well, let's keep on going with the numerical and linear algebra point of view, and just view it as, augmenting the stability of your system, okay? So we're gonna get there, okay? But the main point is that now by adding lambda, what you're doing, you, if you know what the bias is, that's what you're doing, okay? And you're reducing the variance and augmenting the bias. And here I'm just showing you why, oh, another way of looking at this, which is just purely uh, geometric or you know, analytic, I don't know what you wanna call it. It's not statistical, it's just, I was dividing by a small eigenvalue and now I'm dividing by something else, okay? The ratio between these the square of it plus lambda, okay? And this gives you a different way to think about this, which is less statistical and is more so engineering, okay? It's more like filtering. You're, you have something and you're filtering it out. What do I mean? Well, if you allow me to think of, if, you, if you're thinking in terms of frequencies, okay, and Fourier analysis, you have, you know, low harmonics and high harmonics, okay? Now think of big eigenvalues as slow, Frequency, so big harmonics, and to small eigenvalues to high frequencies. Then typically you assume that high frequencies can be the one that leads to trouble and they give you instability. And you assume that you hope, you cross your finger, that most of the energy is in the low frequencies. Well, if you do this analogy, that's what we're doing right here. We are basically saying, when you start to fiddle with small eigenvalues, you better chop them off. And this you can view as a filter function. When lambda is very big, it's a low-pass filter. It just let this low frequency go. Again, frequency here, low frequency are big singular values, okay? If lambda is very big, you throw most of it away. You just have a very narrow low-pass filter. If lambda is very small, you actually allow yourself to go all the way down to whatever you have, okay? So you can view this as a filtering, okay? And if you're familiar with what is called Wiener filtering in signal processing, you, you would not find this unfamiliar. It's basically the same idea. Okay. No. If, if I understand correctly, you would only do this if you have an open curve system, right? 
from this perspective, I'm talking about, yes, the truth is that the things are a bit more um, complicated than that. Because you still, <coughs> you, can, you, you, you still have the problem of noise, and you can see that this amount reduce the noise. Okay. Even for, yeah. okay. Because you said for other determined systems, you could do the inverse, no? You could do the inverse, but you will still pay the smallest eigenvalue. And it might be that if you are uh, choosing lambda correctly, they will typically depend on the signal to noise ratio. You can do what is called denoising. Okay. So even if the matrix X was an identity, we know if, if you give you a vector and I corrupt it with noise, if I know something about the vector, I may be able to get a better estimate than this that removes the noise a little bit. So it turns out that you can do this with lambda. Okay. But I'm thinking of the overdetermined system to just talk about one instead of two. You're talking, but the, 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 you're talking about two different things. So, so this is my matrix X, and each row is an image. Okay, that's X one, that's X two. Okay, you're talking about frequency in here, which is within each vector. Okay, an a, a vector in there, and I'm talking about frequency across. So. It's more like the statistics of the image of a set of images, okay? So if all images happen to have high frequency inside, this means that this high frequency will be the biggest eigenvector of their matrix, okay? So this is a bit more of a specialist question, but basically what I'm, don't conf if you're thinking about image, don't confuse the frequency analysis of an image with the frequency analysis of a set of images together, okay? It might be that if you look at a set of images, the worst possible frequency in Fourier domain is the most likely one. And this can happen here, okay? So that's, that's two different frequencies, okay? This is the frequency across the images, and you're talking about frequency within an image, I guess. So if you come back to the beginning of your talk, is the same as saying that, let's say, the, the images that are very far from what you would expect, you kill them? In a sense, yes. Yeah, in a sense, says, is, in a sense, it says, you know, if if in the image space I have stuff that looks like this, okay, I'm assuming that these are the good guys, and then this, and then whatever is left. So in some sense, where you have a lot of variability, it's what you like. Or where you, you know, the, you, you basically try, the direction you reconstruct your inputs are also the one important to make predictions. And these are, you know, th these are. This is the reason why I do this, okay? Because all of a sudden you see that you did some steps and you're making some pretty heavy assumption on when the algorithm is good or not. Even without doing any statistics, okay? You kind of see that this algorithm is gonna be only good in certain, in certain situations, which are these ones, okay? The one where the direction that uh, give good reconstruction of the data are important, okay? Okay, this is one possible way, okay? Another possible way is to take the variational formulation. So we saw that the moore rose inverse was the solution of a least-square problem. Is this the solution of something, okay? And you can somewhat reverse engineer the gradient and show that this is the solution of this. Again, I write here the gradient of this expression and it's easy to see. Okay, so now you have the point of view. You can stick to this formulation and take a more linear system point of view, but you can also go back here. And how do you see that? Well, if you want, this is yet another point of view. Now you're taking the, a balance. You're not just minimizing the error, but you're now minimizing the error plus a constraint on the W weighted with lambda. How can you interpret this? Well, there are 15 ways of interpreting this, but one way is as a budget on your dimensions, okay? Again, assume that D is much, more than, much bigger than N. Then in some sense, you have too many dimensions, okay, to fill around and find the solution. But if I put a budget on the sum of the weights that I can put in all dimensions, which is what I'm doing when I look at the norm, so what I'm doing there is saying, oh, this sum cannot be too big. And if I make lambda very big, I'm basically ignoring in the limit. I'm essentially ignoring the data and just in the, in the hope that I can find a simple W. 
simple means where the sum is small. So you can view this as kind of an implicit way to reduce dimensionality, yet in another way, okay? Just by shrinking the values of the coefficients. And that's why this thing is also called the shrinkage, okay? And again, this is a very operational perspective on it. And here you just have two different ways to just introduce a way to build learning algorithm. And somewhat, in a, in a, I sneaked in an extra parameter, right? It was a parameter free before, and now I have this extra lamb that I'm not discussing, but this lamb is gonna be magic. It's gonna be the one that allows me to go from fitting, which might be or not a good idea, to extremely stable, which might be or not a good idea. And here is a kind of a summary, okay? So we introduced regularization for a more, uh, say, uh, stability perspective. You can start from the pseudo inverse, which gives you some solution, and you remember that you have this variational formulation. You have the matrix formulation. You have the variational formulation. And now you can go to ridge regression and do the same game. And here, I well, forget about this because I wanted to kill it and alert it. Okay, there is no one over it. Doesn't make much difference. And again, you can call this regularization, in which case you put some bias on certain direction of your space, the one corresponding to the big eigenvalues or singular values. And then you can look at this, and in some sense you do that even more, because now you put lambda and you can really somewhat enforce even more. You can somewhat kill all the information. Yes. Students first. Uh, by the stability of the solution, you mean uh, it's uh, robust with respect to changing the training data? So it would give similar solution if those by solutions are changing the training Yeah. Okay. This is the classical notion of stability. And for the non square penalty term, this is uh, uniformly distributing the budget, of, as I mentioned, right? Rather than killing off. Uh, no. Not uniformly, but uh, it's, uh, again, it's. Is doing that essentially. So I don't know what you mean by uniformly distributed. Uh, I, I, mean, I mean, I try to compare it with the, the one, the L1 norm. So at this level, of, if you know if you know about L1 norm, essentially, you can view it this way. I, I to justify the fact that I had this constraint, I said this is gonna put a budget on the weight. So if say if you just have two, and the first one is much more important than the other. You're gonna to try to depress the second one and keep the first one high, okay? That makes sense? I don't let them do whatever I want. If the one that is more important is gonna get some more weight, the other one I'm gonna to try to depress. Typically, if you do this, they're gonna, you're gonna depress them but not make them zero. If you do the L1 norm, the big difference is that you actually make them zero, okay? You can exactly kill them and make them equal to zero. This can be interesting if you want to read out and interpret what you did. That's a, somewhat at the one level the main difference. Uh, that was a so perhaps one, one other way of interpreting the, uh, the, the, the square of the weights uh, is, uh, is also the square of the gradient of the loss function with respect to zeta. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so what I'm trying to say is you can also view this as a, a measure of sensitivity related to someone taking the gradient of this with respect to the data and see that they, you don't change too much this with respect to your data. So you, you derive this not with respect to W, with respect to, say, X and Y. Absolutely, yes. Going back to the question that you asked about, okay, but can you do it in another way if, if the problem was a small eigenvalue? You can. That was a good... Uh, we did this yesterday night, very late. So see here, okay? There is a, we're, you'll see in a minute that we go down this path tomorrow in a kind of a, with a strange twist, but you, you can ask the following question. All right, you're talking about statistical learning, but statistics disappeared, and all I'm talking about is linear algebra which is a fair thing, okay? I, I view it as a, as a plus, because it means that you can recycle what you know and just pump it up a little bit. And if you go that way, you can say, okay, but in that book I saw, they said there are other ways to solve a linear system in a stable way, okay? But for example, if I tell you that the problem is that 
I don't want to put here 1 over s because the last eigenvalue is small. And you want to fix this. How would you do that? Again, the question is, you have this expression. And you say, oh, I don't like this because this can be very small. As a matter of fact, probably doing this is not the first thing that any human being would think about, presumably, right? What would you do? They're ordered, right? So the first one is the biggest, the second is the big, second biggest, and keep on going. So to fix this, what would you do? You ignore the last one, okay? Because the first one is big, but that, that's the correct thing, clearly, right? So it just is the last one. You, you say, oh, this is too big. Let me put r minus 1. Well, why r minus 1? Maybe r minus 2. Well, you know what? Let me put here m, and I take m smaller or equal than r, okay? And that'd be fine, okay? That's fine, okay? Now, what did we do, though? Well, first of all, we discovered what is called truncated single value decomposition, which is probably the first of the first of the first way of doing this. Second of all, as you see Wednesday, this is also what you might call principal component regression, because it turns out that you can always invent things twice if you publish in two different communities. <laughs> Remember this. <clears throat> and third, did we actually solve the bias problem? Not really, because see, here I have lambda. And there, I call it M, and they play the same game. Here, if I give you infinite data and perfect information, if you put lambda different from zero, you're killing stuff. Here, if I give you perfect information, you're still killing stuff with M. It's true that M, that lambda, is bothering either the large eigenvalues. So in some sense, the equation I showed you before basically says, if the eigenvalue is small, I'm going to bother it. The truth is that this is incorrect. You still add something also to the large one. This one doesn't. And in fact, they have slightly different properties. They're two low pass filters. They have the same shape, but they're slightly different properties. Okay, you can quantify them once you go and do theory and try to make sense of all this condition number, this stability there, random energy theory there. Essentially, what you really do to quantify things, you have to put this into the picture. Okay, you have to do a stability analysis in a quantified way where you say, okay, I'm going to take what I do on the data. And then I'm going to take the same thing on infinite data, and I have to compare. And then I'm going to have uh, approximation things when m goes larger or lambda goes to 0. And then a stability thing when you replace this by that. Okay? And you, then you can quantify whatever we're saying. But at a high level, there are just two different ways to do the same thing. Okay? And that's exactly what we're going to discuss on, uh, on Wednesday. Okay? We're going to start exactly from this to introduce principal component analysis as a generic projected method, projection methods, and then we're going to try to see how to do it in a smarter way. Yeah, you kill, you, you bother them all. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, in one case, you say 1 over s or 0. In the other case, you say, or you only says s divided by squared plus lambda. So even when s is very big, OK, I cheated. It's not quite. You still add something. Here, you add absolutely nothing. Here, you add something. But it turns out that uh, th it doesn't make them. They're more similar than different. Let me put it this way, OK? <laughs> OK. So most of this uh, series of lectures is about doing this in a different way and try to convince yourself that there are some good reason to do that. Okay. So this is what is called the empirical risk minimization principle. And this is incarnation in terms of penalized empirical risk minimization. It's called M estimation in, uh, in statistics, OK? And again, there are a lot of names for the same kind of ideas. And uh, most uh, of what I'm going to try to tell you tomorrow, and this is not the only way to do things. It's nice because it's somewhat, you know, it's a nice principle, OK? We understand that. But it's not the only way to do things. Uh, 
One thing I'm not going to do is uh, go beyond uh, this simple setting. So I'm also going to show you how to replace this whole thing with something that has roughly the same thing. Okay? The main difference is going to be in the computations. Okay? But you can also ask, can I replace this with another loss function? Can I replace this with another norm? Okay? We're not going to discuss that too much in this lecture. It's not because it's not a good question, but because already in this setting, there is some interesting question. I want to stick to those. Okay? The other obvious thing you could ask is, what, can I find, but if we are still looking at linear functions, can I go away from them? And we are going to discuss this for the next 20 minutes a little bit, if we have 20 minutes. Otherwise, it's going to be, yeah. Okay. Okay? So we want to discuss this a little bit, and we take a slightly uh, longer tour. And uh, we talk about no linear functions only today. Okay? And essentially, we do in the simple way. <clears throat> we don't talk about neural networks. That would make all this story much more complicated from a mathematical point of view, and it's much less understood. We do in a kind of uh, class, more classical way that makes the math the same, essentially. Okay, we essentially try to find the one way to make whatever I said for linear function go through for certain classes of nonlinear functions. Okay, so that really almost everything up to a little of abstraction remains the same. Before doing that, we ask a question about computation, which is kind of an appetizer. Okay, so there's going to be a little appetizer interlude, which is based on one observation. You remember here, when you solve this, think about computation for a second. If you solve this, you're solving a matrix is d by d. But in the pseudo inverse, we said, oh, we can actually pick the other one. We actually pick the n by n. Remember, I have two ways of writing. Can I play the same trick? Why would I want to do it? Because again, solving this would be insane when d is much more, but bigger than n, right? So forming this matrix is going to cost me nd square, and inverting is going to cost me d cube. I don't want to do it when this is a million, this is 10. So what did we do before? Well, you can view it in many ways, but essentially there is one nice identity, which is really simple, which is just this, OK? So let's see what I did. Let's convince yourself that it's fine, and then I tell you how to prove it, and we don't do it. I took this matrix, and I move it in front, OK? What happened inside? That I had to swap the order. Now, this makes sense from a pure dimensionality point of view, because this is, n, this is d by n. So when I move it in front, it has to see something which is n by n, not d by d. And this is n by n. Okay? So if you just see the dimension, again, this is d by n. So when I move it here, it has to act on something which is size n. So this has to happen. Why does it happen? Why can you prove it? Well, if you just plug in the SVD, every time you see x or x transpose, you get two identities. Okay, you get this equal to that. So there's nothing going on. You just do it in an exercise. You plug the SVD of x every time you see x, and this is equal to that. It's easy to convince yourself. Well, that, now that we did this, we are back to business, because now you see I all, all I have to do is to invert this matrix. Okay? So there are two different ways to write the same solution. But now all I have to do is I have to solve this problem. So whenever you see the, the role of n and d are swapped. Okay, so this becomes cubic at most in n and quadratic, but only linear in n, but linear in, uh, in d. Okay, and then I have to store the whole matrix. Okay, so on Wednesday, we're going to ask how the hell do you do this when this is a million and this is a million. Okay, because clearly you don't do this. The problem is not even this, it's this. You don't store it anywhere. Okay, so tomorrow and Wednesday, we're going to talk exactly about this, how you can even start scaling up these things, which clearly don't, will not fit not your laptop, but a supercomputer, OK? In the next few minutes, I want to take a couple of observations. The first one is, and again, this is a little bit of an appetizer, you can give an interpretation to this, which is yet another perspective on what you're doing. x is the data matrix. This is just a vector of n numbers. So I can rewrite this expression like this. And view the vector I'm looking for, not for as a generic vector, but a particular vector, which is a linear combination of the columns, no, sorry, rows, okay? So each row is d-dimensional, and the vector I'm looking for is not a generic vector, is a linear combination of my data with weights given by this expression, okay? Is a fact. It's a fact that is trivial. There's nothing going on. Why would you care? 
Well, it turns out that this is useful for two reasons. The first one is this. It just gives you a new interpretation of the algorithm. Plug this w in the expression of f. f is just the linear function with this coefficient. Now you can plug this expression here and use linearity, and you get this. And now you get yet another interpretation of what you're doing. When you get a new point x and you want to predict what it is, you're going to take inner product with the data you already have and put a weight, and this is going to be your way to determine the output. Use the word similarity to describe the inner product, because after all, if these data are centered, then norm one, that's just a correlation, okay? You're basically saying, to determine what is the output of this x, I'm going to take the correlation with all my training set, weight them, and sum them up, and this is going to be my output, okay? So the output is a weighted sum of correlation of the new input with the old inputs. It turns out that this simple expression will be also the key to go to what are called non-parametric models. Non-parametric models are the case where all of a sudden you work with infinite dimensional functions, okay? Turns out that this one very simple expression here will be the one key to go to infinite dimensional models. If I have time, I'm gonna show you why. The spoiler is that essentially you replace this inner product, which is a finite sum, with an infinite sum, which is a series that converges, okay? But anyway, keep this in mind because if we get there, this is how you go to truly infinite dimensional models that are called non-parametric in statistics. So also, admittedly, this last part is a plus, okay? So what was really important for this class, what up to now, I'm sure that now your head is a bit spinning with some ideas if you're not familiar with this. So in this kind of class, typically you give students a bit more than what they can digest, and that's the part that I'm, I know I'm abusing you a little bit, but it's, uh, uh, you can go back to it later on. What do you mean? In the first slide, you replace the matrix product with the number times i. Right? Yeah. So why is that? W is a linear combination. Oh, because C depends also on here. Well, I, I only mean this. Okay. I only, it's a, I'm just saying once you configure the coefficient C i, you're saying, so what he's saying is that C itself depends on x. Yeah. What I mean by this is just that. I can write it as a weighted combination of the xi where the coefficient might depend on xi themselves, okay? okay? I'm just saying, solve this linear system, you get a vector, you get that. That's all I, that's all I mean, okay? You're right. Okay, so let's go to nonlinear models. There is one thing that you do in one line and one thing that takes two lines, okay? The first thing is to say, okay, what if I started from the outset to tell you that I was not working with linear functions, but what I was looking was with the combination of nonlinear functions. So instead of starting with this, we could have started here and say, what are this? You tell me. Sine and cosine, exponentials, polynomials, you name it, okay? Give me one, boom, plug it in there. But you can also say there were sift, hog, if you like speech, MLCC, if you are looking for a specific problem where your friend knows that momentum, whatever energy is what important, what matters, you can put it there, okay? is a set of functions, and they need not be linear. So these functions are not linear, but I combine them linearly. So from a function point of view, you're going from a straight line to a jagged thing, complicated thing. But from a mathematical point of view, this is a vector of, the, of p dimension, and this is a vector of p dimension two. So if I call it phi x, I can write it like this. And then we can stop here, basically. Everything we said so far is fine as long as we pre-process the data and replace x with phi of x. So if you know these functions, if you know them, if you list them, you can just compute them on the data, and you're back to, I just call x x tilde. I called x phi of x, but that's the same. Okay, everything else is a destruction from this basic fact. We did nothing, we changed the name of something. So. What you see is that you have to give a name to the data matrix after the preprocessing. I call it phi hat. And then you use it, and there's nothing going on. Okay? So that's the first observation. If you're willing to predefine your set of nonlinearities and combine them linearly, is the, then everything we did works for nonlinear function. And this gives you a lot of mileage, right? Because you can take a polynomial degree to gazillion 53. You can do that. 
you can write it explicitly, you pre-compute it on your data, and boom, you're now working with thousand-dimensional polynomials, okay? And now imagine that you could fit everything like this. Imagine what you can do now. And imagine that now it's even more important to understand what happened where P is larger than, when D is larger than N, because now P I can generate. That's what I, was, I hinted at at the beginning. I just take product of coordinates, and then sine, and then cosine, and then whatever I want, okay? So the first step to go from linear to nonlinear is completely trivial. I just so realized that I can combine nonlinear features. Okay? So I really don't want to talk much about this because this just uh, is an excuse of why I start from line one and I talk to college students, to PhD students about linear functions. Because but just by doing this, at least you can go immediately to whole nonlinear function, which is a linear combination of finitely many nonlinear functions, okay? But let's make it even a bit more interesting. You remember this? Oopla. Let's do the change of notation. Whenever you see x, I'm going to write phi of x. And whenever you see x hat, I'm going to write this phi hat, which is just a data matrix. Again, I have it somewhere here where I do the phi of everybody, OK? Just it. OK, I'll write it down, and then we stare at it a little bit, OK? OK, so this was the, this was the vector. It was the data transpose C, which means that is the sense we clarified is a combination of the input point with some coefficients. But we also said, oh, I can plug it back here, and I get this expression. And then what I see here is that the expression depends on the inner product in this new feature space. OK, fair enough. What about the coefficient? The coefficient depend on building a certain matrix, which is still n by n. Because remember, this whole game was to go away from the large dimension and be able to just deal with the uh, n-dimensional matrix. So this matrix is n by n. What's in each entry? Well, it's the, again, this kind of magic product of each input to every other input I have. So the function depends only on this input, on this inner product, and the matrix that I use to build the coefficient depends only on this inner product. There's nothing interesting going on in here, okay? I just replaced the inner product with the new inner product after I take the preprocessing. Agree? Now there's going to be a bit of magic. Can I compute this whole thing if the number of features is infinite? It can be interesting, because instead of committing to a 1,000, a million, I could go to infinite. But now infinite doesn't sound like something a computer like, OK? But everything here relies on the fact that I can compute efficiently this inner product, OK? I compute this inner product. I compute this inner product. If I can do it, now, can you imagine a situation where this infinite series converts to a computable number? Well, series do that usually, right? A series is a sum of numbers that is infinite but has a finite value. So it's not inconceivable that an infinite sum will give me something that I cannot, I don't want to use this expression to compute it. I hope that I can compute it regardless of that expression because I don't want to do an infinite sum. I don't want to do an infinite sum and truncate. I just want to look at the sum. But we know that there are series that converge. Okay? Well, let's give an example. Beautiful, and that's exactly what you want after one hour and a half of somebody shouting stuff. But it's actually completely trivial. So start from the bottom, okay? So if you take these crazy features, okay? If you take these crazy features here, turns out that you can actually write down this expression and it's just the Gaussian, OK? So this is just, take it as one example, OK? The calculation in the middle is completely trivial. So let's just take it first as an example. I told you that there, there might be cases that we, we agree, hopefully, that there might be cases where I can put an infinite and still be able to compute. And here I give you an example. And these particular features are a combination of, oh, I'm taking in one dimension just because I'm lazy and notation become a bit annoying. And so in this case, they become an interaction between monomials and exponentials with some weights. That's it, okay? 
How did I choose them? Well, I actually worked reverse engineered it. It starts on the exponential. I took the square. I get an exponential here. An expo well, I start from the Gaussian. I take the square. I get an exponential here. I get an exponential here. Then I get the mixed product. But it's a geometric series. And then, okay, I just write down what the geometric series is in terms of uh, um, its Taylor expansion. That's it, okay? So I go up. So there's nothing interesting in this calculation, right? You can do 15 others. Every time you can take a function of two variables and you can do a Taylor expansion, you can imagine that you have that. But then you don't want to do that. You can start from each, whichever one you want, okay? You can start from these features and then say, can I go to infinity? But you can also think of starting here. Now, what I say here is kind of black magic, okay? So it's simple mathematically, but you still have to convince yourself because all of a sudden you can go to spaces where the number of features is infinite. I do this way because uh, uh, from a procedural point of view, it's completely trivial, okay? All you, view, all you do is to say, you remember this expression? I found myself features that sum to infinity and I call them K. For example, the Gaussian. Now I can write the function like this and the coefficients like this. Where the kernel, where the matrix is just this stuff here, okay? So I'm just telling you more how we do it, okay, than the deep reason why this matters. But the, the, the thing is we were able to go from, you know, in kind of 10, 15 minutes from linear functions to no linear function that are finite combination of uh, finitely many elements to infinite combination of no linear functions. As long as this converges. Now, these, these are large spaces, okay? If the inner functions are small, these are large, large spaces, okay? The space, an infinite dimensional space, which is a combination of Gaussian, is a large space. You can actually approximate anything. It's dense. It's a polynomial of infinite degrees, okay? So now you can ask yourself, what's not in there? Because if linear functions are like that big, this space is huge, okay? And we basically want to stop here, this story, okay? So I'm, making, I'm going to make three remarks, and then we're good. The first remark is you can now start instead of from features, from kernels, from this finite sum value, and ask yourself, okay, wh which one are good, okay? If I found a K, if I found an expression, when is it good? It has to be symmetric and positive definite. And here I remind you what that means, okay? But again, this is just a glance through. And here are just some examples. And you can do a lot of engineering, OK, out of these things. And here, really, this is just a, you know, a peak, OK? Everything we said today, uh, I think, is the nice fact that connects machine learning not uh, to a lot of different things. And here, the list is inverse problems, the one we mostly discussed, linear system. There is a whole connection with max margin theory, OK, the classical Vapnik uh, statistical learning theory perspective. The whole last bit of math I show you connect to a lot of stuff, okay? And here I give you a sort of name because they're large. Reproducing current Hilbert spaces, cardinal leuven expansion in stochastic process, Gaussian processes, and what is called in stochastic analysis Cameron-Martin spaces, okay? So I just went quickly through them because this is not what this class is about. And what the take home mention for you is if I work with linear functions, I get quite a bit of mileage to go to no linear function and even infinite dimensional model. And there's a lot of math, okay, that connect both to stochastic processes and functional analysis. That's the, the take home match of this last bit. Killed one slide, but I want to show you what's completely left out of my story. So again, I can consider a different loss function. I'm not going to discuss this at all. I'm going to consider, you can consider a different norm. For example, a P norm, okay, or whatever you want. You can consider different functions. And this, we actually took some step. And we took them quickly because they are either very long or very short. So we went to the very short way. And we said, okay. I could do this, 
where this is a nonlinearity. Or I could do this. as long as I can compute this, OK? What's left out? Well, we have no linear functions, OK? But we are nice to our math, and we actually consider no linear functions that are parametrized linearly. So the set of parameters they depend on enters in a linear way in the expression. So we somewhat put the nonlinearity in here, and left the w out. Same thing here. We put the nonlinearity in the, on the axis, but we let the coefficient out. Okay? Why? Because all of a sudden, lines become everything. You know, we are still working with lines somewhere, basically. Okay? I spent an hour talking about lines because there's nothing, from an you know, algorithmic point of view, there's nothing to talk about. Whatever you work out for lines is still going to work out. Just think of lines in very high dimensions. Okay? What's left completely out, it's where you actually start from this and then trap the parameter inside the nonlinearity. Okay? Uh, we didn't discuss this at all. Okay? And what is clear is that the math there is going to be different because it's not a linear math anymore. It's not linear algebra anymore. Okay? You can still ask yourself, can I still do this kind of reasoning? And in some cases, we know the answer. But the math, the derivation, the justification has to be completely different. Okay? So many of the things I said translate to that setting. And, but only, as you might know, these are, this is essentially the first step in which you go to a neural network. Right? You trap your parameters inside the nonlinearity, and then you iterate this. And you do, OK, W1 transpose. You put an extra W1 here, essentially. Okay? And you keep on going. We don't go that way, essentially, because there, there are very little we know about that. And so that reserve a discussion in its own right. And so here, I actually advocate the linear case. That's one setting where at least can put some coordinate on some reasoning. Today was just a summary on a perspective, which is kind of the regulariz classical regularization theory perspective on building learning algorithm, revisiting the classical empiric crisis minimization, uh, maximum likelihood estimator, you call it whatever you want, okay? The thing that we're going to do from tomorrow is that we're going to mostly deal with linear models. So essentially, we're never going to do this. We're never going to do this. And we're never going to do this. We stick to this, and we just ask ourselves is if there is different principles to build algorithms. The principle so far was let me go back to the first slide, and then I finished. How, how this whole story started, we said, replace, how did we build the learning algorithm? In these two lines. Replace the objective function with the empirical one. Replace the space of function with a manageable one. OK? Now, clearly, you can do it for other loss functions and other penalty and so on. You can do, do, do. You can still do this, right? You say, I take another loss function and I do that. The computation is going to be different, but I can do it. I add another norm and I can still do that. Sure, I take another function space, you can do that. What we want to discuss is, okay, but is there another way to build the learning algorithm? We're going to take the square loss and linear function as an excuse to find new principles to build the learning algorithm. And then they will most likely apply to all the other cases. So other function class, other norm, other loss. And we only so far know uh, about a bunch of them. OK? OK, so tomorrow this whole story will make hopefully a bit more sense. All right, so I'm done. If you have any questions, I'm here.